We've been doing things with deductive logic, with syllogisms, categorical syllogisms, hypothetical syllogisms, disjunctive syllogisms even within the category of deductive logic. Then we talked about inductive logic and gave some rules for that. And so you can commit fallacies in regards to deductive logic and even inductive logic. And you can commit, you can violate rules of formal logic. But here I want us to talk about informal fallacies. We're talking about informal logic, not formal logic. And so here are some, it's still logic and there's, it's still a fallacy, it's still a logical fallacy, but here are some informal logical fallacies. The first one I want to mention is argumentum ad hominem, that is basically character assassination. You've heard of ad hominem attacks. Well, this is attacking the person rather than the argument itself. So the fallacy would be in and trying to persuade someone to take on your position because of the flawed character of the other person, the person that opposes your position. Now, obviously, it's important for, for us to have credibility. In some cases, the credibility of a witness is important to the case that is being made, but a lot of times with argumentum ad hominem, really what, what you see with, with this is, is an attack on the person rather than on the argument itself. So for example, you can't trust anything he says. He's an atheist and has no basis for morality. Well, of course we disagree with atheism and, and we understand that atheism does have no basis for morality, a true basis, right? They have maybe reasons they, they think they they believe in morality, but that doesn't mean you can't trust anything an atheist says. You still have to evaluate the arguments that he presents. How about this one? If you don't believe in evolution, you are pretty much a moron. You're just a moron. Well, that's attacking the person rather than the idea of creation. Or the reason you believe in creation is because you were raised in a Christian home. Well, that's, that's an attack. That's, 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 that's to be taken as an insult. The fact that, that you were raised in a, a Christian home, that's a bad thing. And therefore you shouldn't, someone shouldn't trust your, your position or your arguments. Well, that's, that's the argumentum ad hominem. There's a, a similar one that's, that's called poisoning the well. And this is discrediting in advance the source of the evidence for the argument. You want to get down to the source and, and discredit it. Uh, so things like you should consider the source. Uh, you, want, you want to discredit the person somehow. And, and, and a lot of times this is through attacking their character. And then argumentum ad populum. What's this? This is deciding truth by majority vote or popular appeal. Well, we don't want to just do that, right? Truth isn't decided based on counting noses, right? So for example, number one bestseller. Is, is that a, a good reason? to buy something just because a lot of people have bought it? Well, no, that's, I mean, that, but that's, that's, the, that's the argument that's being presented by that label, right? I mean, that's the impression you wanna get, you wanna, you wanna give. Many, many people must like this book and therefore it must be a great book. And so, um, but that's not, that's not a good, that's not a good argument. Everybody's doing it. Well, just because everybody's doing it doesn't mean it's right, right? Peer pressure is argument to mad populum. Uh, the scientific consensus is that the world is billions of years old. Okay, 
Well, sometimes we can use the consensus and sometimes the, the consensus does help us understand the truth, but just because the majority of, of scientists agree on something doesn't make it true. So we have to evaluate the evidence and, and you have to evaluate the, the reasons that, that they hold that position and understand that, like in this case, there are many credible scientists, very well trained, very well credentialed, who would, who would actually have the opposite opinion, that it's actually not billions of years old. Straw man. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's drawing a false picture of the opposing argument. So a straw man is easier to knock down than a real man, right? If you were fighting them. Well, that's what you're doing though. What you're doing is you're drawing a false picture and then attacking that argument or that position rather than the real position. So you Republicans are for starving children. You're the party of the rich. You want to keep poor people poor. Well. If you know much about politics and, and you're in the know, you know that's not really, that's not really uh, what the position of the Republicans are. Creationists believe that God created all the species exactly as they are now. Well, maybe there's a few out there. I don't know anybody who believes that. Creationists, mainstream creationists, people that I know, Answers in Genesis, Canham, they believe that God created everything according to its kind and then diversified from that. And that's, a, that's very different than creating all species exactly as they are now. Creationists don't believe in science or the scientific method. Well, that's a straw man. That's not true at all. But there's a lot of confusion about that out there, isn't there? I remember uh, just uh, a couple weeks ago, I was at a, a parts store for an auto parts store, and I talk, started talking to this guy behind the counter, and somehow I was trying to get the conversation into a discussion of God and religion, and uh, that happened. And he said, well, I believe in, in God, but I'm not sure you can believe in God and science at the same time. So he wasn't sure what to believe. I don't know if he... Maybe he was questioning his belief in God because of this confusion. How could you believe both? Well, we had that discussion. Of course you can believe in science. True science is, is very consistent with, with belief in God. I mean, God created science. And then there's the complex question. So what's this? The reader is expected to take two parts of a statement together when in reality one is acceptable and the other is not. So a lot of times it's in the form of a question and there's an assumption in the question. Here's the classic example. When did you stop beating your wife? Well, that assumes that you have been beating your wife or used to. And now the question is, when did you? Well, make sure you know I've been beating my wife before you ask me, when did I stop beating my wife? But I've never started beating my wife, right? Where did you hide the money you stole? That assumes that you stole the money. It's a complex question. Why are creationists against science? You see, I'm using a lot of creation examples because they're very popular out there in, in culture. Um, that's this, the assumption is that we're against science, but we're not. When are you going to stop believing nonsense and accept science. Well, the assumption is that, that what you're believing is nonsense. Well, I'm not gonna accept that premise. There's special pleading. That's another informal logical fallacy. This, is, this happens when only the evidence that supports one view is cited and the rest is left out. For example, only, one, only cite incidences in which Christians have done harm to society and not give due weight to all the good that Christianity has done. I mean, you can pull out examples from, from, from 
history. Um, here's a, a lighter, a lighter example. Um, there's, you know, 19 studies that show that smoking is wrong. One study show that smoking does no harm, but that's the only one that you cite in your in your uh, cases, in your examples, in your argument. Or citing only the evidence that seems to point to a, an old earth when most methods of dating point to a young earth. Well, that, that's, not, that's not valid, that's not right. It's special pleading. How about this one, faulty dilemma. This happens when only two options are given when there are more options. For example, Albert Camus in The Plague, either you must join the doctor to fight the plague, or you must join the priest and do nothing so that you are not fighting against God. Well, it's not either or. There's another option. Uh, you, you, can, you can join the doctors and fight for God because God doesn't like people to suffer, does he? Or either God is sovereign or man has a free will. It can't be both. But really, the fact is that God is so sovereign that he was not afraid to give man free will. He sovereignly decreed that man have freedom, freedom to choose. So that's a fallacy. It's not an either or option. Either you have reasons for what you believe or you simply take it on faith. No, that's not my position. I have good reasons for what I believe. Those reasons bolster my faith. They don't undermine the faith. It's not an either or option. I could never be a creationist because I'm rational. Well, what's the, what are the two options here? You're either a creationist or you're a reasonable person. You can't be both. Well, that's not right. We can be a rationalist, a rational creationist. How about this one? Faulty analogy. What are some examples of this? Uh, because a, a faulty analogy is the situation where not enough similarities between the two things compared. So, for example, this is just a, a fun one. I don't know if anybody really believes this, but students are like nails. Just like nails, they need to be hit on the head to make them work. I don't think there's quite enough similarities. Uh, uh, I, have a, I have a couple more examples here uh, about that. We should, we should not feel bothered if we offend people with the gospel. After all, in order to make an omelet, you have to break a few eggs. Wow. Uh, I don't think that's a good analogy. Or... Uh, I think I skipped one here. Believing in creation is like believing in a flat earth. Wait a minute. <laughs> there are not enough similarities. Uh, there, there is no credible evidence for a flat earth. And there's a lot of credible evidence for, for belief in creation. What about uh, once a sun, always a sun? Hmm. I think that's a faulty, a faulty analogy. Not enough, not enough similarities. Uh, once, once you're born, you can't be unborn. Well, but you can, you can, you can die. Of course, the comparison is between physical birth and 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 uh, spiritual birth. But you can die, right? So the, the the analogy doesn't work. All right, and then appeal to force. This is called argumentum ad baculum, appeal to force. This is substituting the threat of force for reason 
and evidence. You will sign this confession or we will shoot your crew one at a time, said the Nazis. Well, that's, that's, that's appeal to, to force. Or campus riots or city riots, Black Lives Matter or Antifa. Yeah. Force, trying to use riots to, to have your way. Yeah, that's, that's, not, that's not a, this substitution is not a good substitution. If you teach creation in this school, we will sue you. Hmm, that's, that's appeal to force. And then begging the question. This is reasoning in a circle, using your conclusion as a premise, assuming the thing to be proved as proof of itself. For example, since I'm not lying, it follows that I'm telling the truth. Or the experts agree with me. I know they are experts because the definition of an expert is someone who agrees with me. I mean, they're not saying that, but that's kind of what they mean. Now they're saying that in so many words. Or the fossils date the rocks. Well, how do you know how old the fossils are? Well, there are certain rocks that date the fossils and, and, and it goes in a circle. How do you know how old the, the, uh, the rocks are? Well, the fossils date the rocks. That's, that's begging the question, arguing in a circle. Creation cannot be true because it involves the supernatural. Well, I think you're arguing in a circle. You're saying that the supernatural is is some the supernatural is something that we are arguing for. We don't we don't just eliminate that option at at the beginning. Um, so that that is arguing in a in a circle or it's begging the question. It is, is assuming, in that case, that uh, there is no such thing as the supernatural. Equivocation. Using a crucial term in an argument in two different senses. So, for example, now this is just a fun one that I'm sure no one ever really believes in, but the sign says fine for parking there. So, since it was fine, I parked there. Well, obviously, there's two different ways in which the word fine is used there. This is, this is a big one though, uh, microevolution versus macroevolution. What happens a lot of time is that evolutionists use evidence for microevolution or really it's, it's a variety within kinds because there are, is small change, but it's within the kind and it's based more in the, in the re combining of characteristics through, through uh, either uh, breeding or just in nature, there is some natural selection going on, but it's, it's breeding different, different breeds based on recombining of genetic characteristics. That's not the kind of mechanism that you have to have for macroevolution to occur. There has to be a much more serious process going on, right? You have to have mutations that produce new information over time. And that doesn't happen. And there's a big difference. So you, what you don't want to do, what you, you, you should not do, and what the evolutionists try to do is use evidence for microevolution, like the differences in the size of beaks in different birds for, 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 the, for proof, as proof for macroevolution. And that doesn't work. All right, one more, one more example. Evolution is a scientific fact. The evolution of bacteria becoming resistant is well documented. So, we're not using, you don't, you don't use the term microevolution and macroevolution, at least they don't usually do that, but they're using evolution in two different senses. So evolution is a scientific fact. Well, the fact 
of evolution is in the, the small changes that occur within kinds. That's a fact. That's known. That's observable. But they're claiming that macroevolution is a scientific fact. That, that's, what, that's what they're claiming. The evolution of bacteria becoming resistant, that is microevolution. That's, that's a variation. And that does not prove macroevolution, as is the assumption of that, that first clause there. All right, so I've, I've shared with you a few informal logical fallacies. There are more. I hope you get a chance to study even more of these um, informal logical fallacies, because we need to be really careful with how we, we talk about things, how we, how we reason both formally and informally. All right, we'll see you next time.